name is Maria Belcher, and I'm the Executive Director at Festival Charleston. I hope you're enjoying the 15 days of art, music, theater, dance, and so much more coming to you from Charleston, West Virginia, as a part of our 2020 Virtual Festival. Up next, we have a Creators Program event uh, brought to you by West Virginia State University's Economic Development Center. Special thank you to Tiffany Ellis Williams for helping make this possible. Uh, we have Larry Gross and Danny Boyd. They are going to tell us all about their process for turning Paradise Park the movie into a musical that was then performed uh, in 2018 by Theater West Virginia. And I hope you all enjoy and uh, feel free to visit festivalcharleston.com for a full list of events and direct links to all of the wonderful content that make up the 15 days. And now I'll kick it over to Larry and Danny. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Danny Boyd, and I'm with my pal Larry Gross uh, for our festival virtual presentation of Screen to Stage, which is about our adaptation from my movie Paradise Park to our musical with Theater West Virginia that started with uh, Paradise Park, the musical. The film was 1992 is when it was released. We shot it in 91. Larry played the lead character, Marlon, which uh, again adds to the synchronicity of all of us coming here together. Uh, historically, uh, I had made, we had made two feature films within two and a half, almost three years that were very successful and they were low budget films, but nationally and internationally distributed. But of course they were genre movies, horror, science fiction, and comedy. And I wanted to write a more serious picture, but I knew that that was the kiss of death for a, a low budget movie. So I just used the, our typical humor and more of a drama, uh, you know, to roll the dice. Uh, and it, it worked out for us. Uh, Paradise Park is, again, it's a microcosm. It's a 24 hour story, uh, takes place in, a, in one particular place, an isolated place in Southern West Virginia but we wanted it to speak to the larger world. Um, and that's what we tried for, and um, it has made it to a broader audience, and now it's circled back after 32 years. Long time. Yeah. 20, what is it, 28 years? Yeah, yeah long, long time. Um, so any, at any rate, fast forward, our dear friend Burke Allen, Allen Media Strategies, contracted me to do Homer Hickam's Rocket Boys Festival. And when I came down, Scott Hill was the uh, director of that and the director of Theater West Virginia. And the first day I met him, he said, you know, I've always wanted to meet you because I want to tell you that Paradise Park's my favorite movie. I said, well, thank you very much. I've, you know, I've heard that from a few people. Well, later in the day, uh, you know, he brought up again. He said, no, seriously, it's of all time movies, it's, Paradise Park is my, is my favorite movie. So the third time he brought that up and I said, well, if you love it that much, you could own it because I don't have the rights. You could buy it. And by God, he did. <laughs> and then not too much later, he approached me and because he, again, he, he was doing Rocket Boys, but he also had Theater West Virginia. But he said, what do you think about, you know, since we've got the property, what do you think about Paradise Park as a musical? And I said, well, that's a no brainer. We thought of it, we called it our hillbilly opera when we wrote it. There were two full musical numbers. You know, it was in a confined space. Um, so I thought, yeah, it's, it's perfect for that, but I don't know if, if I'm capable of doing it. I've never written anything for the stage. So I said, well, we'll, we'll think about it. And, and Scott said, do you think Larry would do it? And I said, I don't know, I'll, I'll ask him. So Larry and I had lunch and I said, this could be the most unusual conversation of all of our un unusual conversations about this. And, uh, you know, I pitched him and instantly thought, well, that's a wonderful idea. But he said, yeah, I don't know if I can do it, but even if I can't, you should do it. And I said, that's what I'm thinking. I don't know that I can do it, but you should do it. But we did, you know, and Larry said, well, you know, you got this. And I said, well, I did the same thing that I do whenever I start anything new is I, I bought a book on Amazon about writing for the stage for musicals and read the book. And I said, well, well we know this. And Larry said, I told you. Um, so we just started hammering it out. Um, the procedure was, uh, we, we, we watched the original movie. 
and it had been years since either of us in my living room. And we were taking notes and saying, wow, nothing has changed in almost 30 years, except for the hairdos. It's, it, it's almost the same. So do you remember how we... Well, yeah, it's, you, when you came to me and, and asked that, I, I thought, well, I've never, I've written a lot of songs, but I've never written songs for a musical. I don't, I don't know about that. But I love musicals, especially the conventional ones. Some of the first things I ever listened to in my house were Guys and Dolls and Bells Are Ringing. And I mean, there's a bunch of it because my parents were big fans. And I, and I started getting into uh, going to musicals at, with Light Opera Guild here in Charleston when I moved down here. So I liked it. And I thought, this is something I always wanted to do. I've written some situational songs for Disney books. So I knew I could possibly write songs if there was a situation. Uh, and that's kind of nice because it's like an assignment. It's not like write a song. It's like write a song about this. And I thought maybe I can give that a shot. So well, we had nothing to lose. You know, we, we Danny, I knew could write scripts. He'd written a bunch of scripts and he taught it and everything else. So I knew he'd be able to, to find his way through it, even though it's different. It's not like a movie exactly, of course. And it's not like a stage play exactly because you have songs. So we thought we'd go through the musical and we basically agreed, this is a good spot for a song. We knew we had one song already because in the in this original movie, I wrote the theme, Par you know, Paradise Park. And so we would use that. I co-wrote it with Webb Wilder. We thought we'd use that. Then we knew we needed a bunch of other songs. So we uh, I had another song that I'd already written I thought would work in one of the parts and Danny agreed once in a lifetime. But after that, it was like, let's go through and let's find places in the show where we think there should be a song and then we'll start from there. Mm -hmm. And that's, I guess, where we're gonna start from right here. Yeah. We'll go to the first situation uh, that we came to. And we're gonna to try to do five scenes here, if, if, if time allowing. Uh, it's just ones that we thought might work for this presentation. Look, he's here, he's here. It's not God, it's the damn governor. Gather around everyone. The governor has selected your community for one of our road stop visits to personally explain our new deal for development. Is that anything like your plan for progress? Uh, what was that other one? Fighting for the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we feel the deal for development is the right plan get West Virginia back on her feet. But it won't be easy. It's gonna take all of us. Is this the plan that's gonna get me my job back? Yeah. 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 Our retraining program has been very successful. Very successful. Retraining for minimum wage. I made $17 an hour in the mines. How the hell am I supposed to pay my bills on minimum wage? I know it's hard for you all to understand, but things are starting to get better now. One-fourth of our people live below the poverty line. We have the highest rate of unemployment, the biggest decrease in population in the country over the last decade. You call that making progress, Governor? You a statistician or a reporter? No, a teacher. I should have known. Let's not forget the lowest teacher pay in the country. You know, you should listen to yourselves sometime. Like a bunch of whining grandmothers, you're quick to complain and pontificate but not to come up with where the money for your raises will come from. Well, that's your job. Yeah. Yeah, my job. Let me tell you about my job. You know that guy at the circus, balances spinning plates on sticks? That's me. As Soon as I get one fixed, another starts to fall to the ground. It takes every bit of energy that I have to keep them all from crashing. Hey, mister, hey, mister. What's your problem? I ain't got no problem, mister. I just want to go fishing. Oh, that's nice. Pick on the retarded. He's not retarded. He's slow. Man has to leave the damn state to get work. I'm so sick of hearing that. If that's how you want to deal with the problem, go ahead and leave. And we don't need you. Go to hell. Yeah, you go to hell. What the governor meant to say was that Shut he... up. Get in the car. Any of you ever work out of state? Then why are you back? I'll tell you why. People aren't friendly. 
They make fun of the way you talk. You have to worry about getting mugged or your kids smoking crack. You make good money, but it ain't home. You want the truth? Maybe we are screwed. You're not gonna get your job back. They dig cleaner coal twice as cheap in other countries. We're trying to get new industry into the area. We can't force them to come here. I'm sorry I don't have the answers. One time I thought I did, but not now. Like it or not, we're in this together. We can go through it as friends or as enemies. I prefer friends. We're having a little get-together tonight, Governor. You think you can make it? You know, there's nothing I'd enjoy more, ma'am. But I need to be target practice for a few more communities before dark. But thanks for asking, anyway. Now there's some good news for a change. <laughs> That's where we looked at that scene and we're trying to figure out what to do with that. Uh, what we decided to do was to change the tone of it a bit. I mean, my, at least I decided to because I was writing a song and you'll hear in the song, you're gonna hear the song in just a minute. You will hear in the song a lot of the lines that Danny wrote for the governor and for some of the other people. Uh, we wanted to make it a production scene and uh, the director really turned it into a cool thing because the director used dancers to be like uh, uh, news people that follow the governor around with cameras and then the people in the park were, were you know, talking to him and then he goes into this song and it, he does it in, in a much more uh, a light way than, than there, uh, but he does, Tell the truth. I mean, he does. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, the language has changed from those days, but the issues have not changed. And he and he turns the tide, turns the story completely around, just like we did in, in the movie with um, Porter Wagner, wonderful late Porter Wagner. Um, but but also, I, it was one of the first songs Larry wrote, and I heard it, and it was it was so wonderful. And I was almost reluctant, but I said. I just only have one request. And he said, what? I said, if you could write just one more short verse, you would cut out a page and a half of my dialogue. Next day he had it. So, so there's the key. We're trying to replace pages of dialogue with a song. And he added that one, which he was going to have to add. Um, and so it ended up, it just went into the song. So now we're going to listen to the song, which I, even the title of it, Plates on a Stick. You heard what the governor said. He's the guy trying to keep the plates on the stick going there. Oh, can I tell that story? Yeah. The, the, the way that line came from is uh, when Gaston Caperton was governor, he was very, very supportive of us. I heard him say that. You know, he says, I'm like the guy in the circus bouncing plates on a stick. And that, that's where the initial idea came from. And Danny mentioned the governor was played by Porter Wagner, the great country music star. Also, you may have noticed that one of the guys in the park was Johnny Paycheck, another famous country music star. We had several country stars that were in Paradise Park. So, okay, here's the song that that scene was boiled down to. Plates on a stick, they're just a spinning. I gotta fight to save this state, and I'm not winning. My constituents are here, and they ain't grinning. When you get elected, that's just the beginning. I get a long list of gimmies every morning. A bunch of troughs I'm supposed to pour the corn in. And the backstabbings come without a warning. Sometimes I curse the place that I was born in. You think this job is easy, why don't you try it? Go make a plan, see if anyone will buy it. It's like telling some fat guy go on a diet. Say one wrong word and you can't start a riot. Well, you 
your coal job, it's not coming back now. Yeah, there ain't no war on coal, that's just a cow town. And frack gas is a whole lot cheaper anyhow. You traded in your vote for someone's sacred cow. And you say you have to leave this state to make it. If you find a high-paid job, go ahead and take it. When you're not happy there, you'll have to fake it. Cause you leave your heart back here, you'll have to break it. They'll laugh at how you talk and how you look. They'll ask you if you've ever read a book. Not one of them knows how to bait a hook. And their mama never taught them how to cook. And let her rip, boys. Your Facebook and your Twitter and all them hate toys. Ask that burned out hippie who he employs. And that young banker what tax breaks he enjoys. Things are getting worse. You say it's my fault. Like there's a secret formula in some fault. If it's not too bland, it's got too much salt. You're waiting for Jesus or Marx or maybe John Galt. We have a lot of problems, I know it's true. You find that perfect place and I'll go there with you. Someday when your IOUs come due, this will be the place you come back to. We have a lot of problems, I know it's true. You find that perfect place, I'll go there with you. Someday when your IOUs come due, this will be the place you come back to. Right here will be the place you come back to. Yeah, this will be the place you come back to. So there you go. Uh, by the way, all of these songs will be performed by the cast of the first year at Theater West Virginia, and they did some, some great work. Andy, that did the governor there, was fantastic. Uh, and he did a lot of, during the solo, he did a lot of bits of business where he goes around and gets kids to pray with him. It's really, it was really classic. So that's how we take, took that scene and turned it into a musical production. This time, it's really a production. There was dance and movement as well as the song. Um, and that's what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna go through a few more of these and just to show you how we tried to take pages of dialogue and make them into songs. Um, Man Will Work, um, the character there, I, I wrote the movie, I was really greatly influenced by Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. It was a 24 hour story that took place in the same neighborhood and had flights of fantasy. Well, we wanted lots of, you know, a, a one desperate place, central place that went with a flight of fantasy because the, the whole premise is based on old lady in the trailer park Nada gets a vision that God's going to grant them all a wish. So they don't believe it, but they have a pause and wonder, well, what if, what would I wish? And it's always material things throughout the whole movie, which most were pretty entertaining. Um, but the character of man will work with Gary Brown and Gary's one of my favorite actors and favorite people. Um, I didn't want to have any lines that he just, he's stoic the whole time, except with his young son. And we always joke because we don't, we, we won't have to worry about Gary remembering his lines, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, a, and he, he comes out through, through, through the whole story. But what I wanted to say in the, in the scene, in the movie was everyone thinks when people don't work that they're begging, that they're trying to get handout, you know, and, for the most part, that is not absolutely not true. And man will work. We don't even know his name, but man will work. It takes no public assistance. He's proud. He stands there and holds a sign that says man will work every day, trying to get any kind of work he can, trying to set an example for his son. And he feels humiliated. People just ignore him. 
So let's see the scene, and then uh, we'll talk about the song. I can't even remember his name. He's become like the invisible man, someone everyone tries not to see. I guess he could never accept not having work. Instead of blaming everything else like all the others, he blamed himself. Any man willing to work ought to be able to find work. He hadn't. He wore that sign around his neck like Jesus bore the cross. Nada said God's coming to give us all a wish. Maybe he'll give you a job, Daddy. So there is uh, the scene of man will work. And by the way, the son says, Natus uh, said that God's going to come and give everybody a wish. If you don't know the plot of the movie, can't go through all of it, but an, an elderly woman in the trailer park, the way it starts in the middle of the night, she has a dream or a vision that God's going to come and grant everybody a wish. So one of the problems we had too was how are we going to show these, these, these dreams, these wishes, you can do a fantasy scene in a movie like that, but you can't really do it on stage as easily. So with this one, the man doesn't talk, but I said, well, he could sing as a, in part of the fantasy scene. Uh, and so I wrote a song and, and it incorporated a lot of the stuff that the narrator, you heard the narrator, it's a teenage narrator to the whole show. And what the teenage narrator said, I tried to put some of that into the song as well as what Danny just said. This man is not a bum. He really wants to work, but times are tough. There's not any work, and you get to see in the song what he thinks inside, and his son gets to hear it also. Some people think that I want something for nothing. Justin and be looking for an oyster with a pearl. Let me tell you what, son I don't want their money I want a future for you And every poor little boy and girl When I grew up Nobody went to college My daddy worked down in the mine He made a decent way all I needed I didn't know I was living in a different kind of age Some people say that I want something for nothing I live off their taxes like a dog begging for a bone Let me tell you
Kevin Stokes doing the singing there. This is uh, the record that we're taking this off of. It's made from the first year's cast, Theater West Virginia. You can still get it there. And on the first song, the governor's song, that was Andy Ritter uh, who played the governor and doing the singing. And some of the musicians, I'll just, I won't say this to every song, but uh, had some of the best West Virginia musicians. Johnny Staff played the mandolin and fiddle and guitar. And, uh, Chris Stockwell's on the Dobro, you heard that on the first two things. Ron Sorrell and Ryan Kennedy were co-producers and they play on the record. Ahmed Solomon played drums, a lot of great folks on there. But there, there you see what we tried to do, taking that scene, which you couldn't do on the stage easily, and turning it into a song uh, about a guy who really wants to work. Wants to give. Yep. He, he wants, wants to take, give. he wants to give. Yep. So, and it turned out to be very touching the way it worked. He and his son, uh, and it can be staged in many different ways. They did it a couple of different ways. The two years they did it at Theater West Virginia. By the way, as you probably know, we were going to do this uh, during festival, the uh, Light Opera Guild, Charleston Light Opera Guild was going to stage it. We hope that they're going to do it as soon as they can get back into production, but everything. And the reason we're on line here is because we can't do anything in person right now. So what's next? Yeah. Oh, this is Nada's grandson who has gotten away from Paradise Park, the, the trailer park. And he's been ashamed of his life, and he's tried to, he's joined suburbia, uh, but, but he feels this guilt, and he, he, he blames the park for it. But the only piece that's still holding him is his grandmother, Nada, who keeps trying to bring her home. And she says, why? This is my home. These are my people. I, I, I love it. And in this fantasy, it's, it's him trying to justify or finally exercise his demon of not feeling guilt over leaving. Yeah, the, the, one of the themes of the movie, it was kind of unstated, but in the, in the play, it's a little bit more stated, is those who left, left and those who stayed. Mm -hmm. And he left, Wesley left, his grandmother Nada stayed. There's nothing wrong with either one, mm -hmm. but where, where Wesley went, they were trying to make him feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. So let's see the scene. You're not her keeper, hon. You shouldn't feel responsible. She wouldn't live here even if we'd let her. I know you don't want to think about this, but there are nice places for people like her. Who are people like her? Old ladies who get special instructions from God. And besides the hefty purse that's involved in winning the Shoney's PGA Classic, there's much more at stake for this young club pro, wouldn't you say? Oh, I should say so. Wesley has been waiting for a putt like this his entire life. Miss it, and he stays where he is. Make it, and he transcends his inertial existence, giving him a first-class ticket to the first world, while escaping the prohibitive heritage that has kept him down so long.
So there you saw the fantasy that Wesley had. Uh, so you saw the stereotypical uh, country club crowd and the stereotypical uh, uh, hillbilly crowd. And he was kind of torn between the two. He really wanted to get to the country club crowd, but in his heart too, he hated to leave his grandmother there, you see at the end. Yeah, and, at the very end is yeah. be careful what you wish for. Yeah. Because your and, wish might come true. And, and that's, that's a, a, a tough thing to do. On the stage, that would have been very difficult to pull off. So. What we decided to do was to make a, a kind of half sung, half spoken song uh, that, that we played for comedy and it got a lot of laughs uh, because it was about the homeowners association at his new place, trying to talk him into signing. What was it? Uh, it was a, a bill to, to pass, to get rid of uh, trailer parks, basically, yeah. there, were, there was other language for it because it was hurting their property values. And that they're, they're getting good subsidized homing, uh, housing down in the uh, other county, other part of the county. Yeah, so he, they, they're trying to convince him to sign this uh, petition that uh, really will get rid of the place where he grew up and the people and, and have to have, they have to resettle somewhere else. Uh, and that's really, starts getting, tearing him up a bit. So this, uh, so what you hear in this song is is him and Danny's voice. I think plays Wesley here, uh, and then you hear these homeowners association guys who on stage are played by part of the chorus, and they're basically just giving him a chance to say what's on his mind while they're keep insisting that if he just signs here, everything will be different. Hey guys, what's just sign, and your future gets better today. Petition from our homeowners association to enforce the county commission to rezone the temporary housing in our area, destroying our property values, our general quality of life. Temporary? As in trailer parks? Just sign, and your future gets better today. Where would they go? Just sign, and your future gets better today. Other side of the county, subsidized housing, better school for their kids. Their kids? They're the same kids that go to ours. Ride their bikes to school. I was one of their kids. Just sign, and, and the shame of your past goes away. Is there another way? You're gonna push this through whether I sign or not. Belong, and your future gets better today. Belong? Just sign, and your future gets better today. Just sign, and the shame of my past goes away. So there you see, uh, that's what we made it into. It's very brief and it worked very well. The, the, the guys who, uh, who did it on stage at Theater West Virginia were dancers and so they had some choreography that really made it funny. And his wife, Wesley's wife, joins them. But she obviously is a force who wants to get him out of the trailer park into the suburbs. So that's how we handle that. Next up, is uh, a scene about the, the original uh, woman who had the vision that starts this whole thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, Nada, she really wants it for, for other people. It's sort of a catalyst when she talks about the idea of, of the vision. Uh, but, but like all the other characters, you think they, it, when they open their ideas to, to have a fantasy of their dream come true, it's always material things. And we find out what is, because when Nada can win anything in the world, we see at the end which prize she wanted the most. Yeah. So in the movie, as you'll see, she actually wins the lottery, and then we'll see how we treat it with the song. <laughs> To the West Virginia Lottery, dreams come true. Let's say hello again to this week's three finalists. Now completing her second doctorate from Harvard and currently in the lead with 110 points, Susan. <laughs> Dick, now in second with 85 points, has a government research project at Marshall University. <laughs> and bringing up the rear with no points, Nada. <laughs> Nada.
Gene Ada, you've got an awful lot of ground to cover in this final round. Do you think you still have a chance? Yes, sir. There's always hope. And what college did you say you graduated from, Nada? I took a, a nurse's aid course at the Votech Center, but I never actually went to college. <laughs> you have the honor, Susan, from questions submitted by our studio audience for 50 points. It is a fallacy that the people of Appalachia never travel. They do, once a year, known as the Hillbilly Riviera, for 50 points, where do they go? Atlantic City? No, I'm sorry. Dick? The Smokies. No, Dick. Wrong again. Is it Myrtle Beach? Why, yes, that's right. I thought so. We used to stay at a really nice KOA there. Back to you, Nada. Complete the popular Appalachian anecdote. Why did St. Peter have to build a fence around heaven? To keep West Virginians from sneaking home on weekends. That's correct. <laughs> With the game, now up for grabs, the last question is back to you, Nada. Recite the most popular novelty license plate found on cars and trucks in Appalachia. <laughs> out of time. Aww. Susan? Honk if you love Jesus. Dick? When guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. <laughs> Last chance. Nada? Eat more possum? That's right. You're our winner. Come on down and take your chance at making your dreams come true. Now, as you know, Nada, there are lovely and valuable prizes from the West Virginia Lottery behind each of these doors, but only one grand prize made up of cash and prizes selected from your personal dream list. Now, is there anyone at home you'd like to say hello to? Oh, I'd love to say hello to my grandson, Wesley, and his family, and all my friends at Paradise Park. Okay, well, let's get to it. Nada, which door will make your dreams come true? Take a look. From the West Virginia Lottery, a $1 million savings account in your name at One Valley Bank, the one bank for all of West Virginia. And from your dream list, a new state-of-the-art double-wide with satellite dish. And world peace. You've done it, Nada. You've won peace on Earth. <laughs> and if that's not enough, your extra special dream list wish. An extended traditional family where elders are respected, not quarantined. Way to go, Grandma! Grandma, you're proud. Go ahead. Tell her the good news. Grandma, we want you to park your double wide at our house. Oh. I'm so proud of you, Grandma. So there was uh, Nada's fantasy and could have made it over the top kind of like that, but decided we didn't want to go in that direction. Danny was going to actually just get rid of it totally. But I said, uh, and Danny's daughter too, Dan, yeah, we both said, this is that we should probably try to save something of, because Nada is such an important figure and you really don't know that much about her. Yeah, I would have written something, but uh, I didn't know about that. And both uh, 
Larry and Danielle. And Danielle was, was chief uh, attorney for the lottery at the time. And both said, mm, I don't know, that's a pretty good sponsorship possibility. And it, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a, a good angle. And it turned, they were sponsors of the movie and they were also sponsors. Yes. You notice a little production. product placement here. It's an oh, yeah. <laughs> unsubtle product placement, which is fine. But what I decided to do is something kind of that I always wanted to do, which is write a song about numbers. Lot of, what is the no, no, lottery? It's the numbers game. It's the old numbers game. So I wrote a song called uh, The Old Numbers Game, which tells you something. Nada sings it, and it tells you something about Nada in the song.
was um, Regina Wilson Brown, who played the part of Nada the first year at uh, Theatre West Virginia. So you learn a little bit about Nada in this song, and you realize that also it isn't the money that she cares about, it's the memories of the people that the numbers stand for. And I know that uh, with a lot of folks who play numbers games, uh, that is a big deal. If you go up and to the casino and ask somebody why they're betting on these numbers on the roulette wheel, you might find some interesting facts and about uh, them and their family and their life and their history. So that's what we did with that. Well, and, and also in the story, you don't see it here, but we, we wrote, we rewrote the, uh, how it would work on stage. And the only person who speaks is Casey, the jaded 16 year old. And during Nada's narrator. fantasy, yeah, narrator. During um, Nada's fantasy, he, he listens or she listens, depends on who had played the character. Um, the whole time and we think oh my god she's won the lottery and he says yeah nada's all late nada's numbers came in you know she she hit the lottery but it's the same old ticket that she'd always carried for as long as she knew it was never about the money it was about the memories right and it's seen in the second act where they're gonna nada said god's coming and she's kind of shamed them all into having well let's have a party they they they, they love nada they don't necessarily believe God's going to come to the trailer park, but they want, they don't want to embarrass her. So they say, let's have a party, a God watch party. They're in the middle of the God watch party. The uh, lot, lottery comes on and they all have tickets. So they all get out their tickets to see. And as you hear the numbers being announced in that song, then they all, well, they didn't win. Nada did win, but it, it wasn't, she didn't have a current ticket. So that's not what it was all about. So we have uh, one more and it's another fantasy scene that um, we took and, and then gave it a twist on something that wasn't in the movie, a comment about Appalachians, West Virginians that, that are in the service and they fight in wars. But tell them about the first who the characters are here. Yeah, Evelyn is the, uh, the mother of Skipper, who is our favorite little boy in the park who's all autistic, and just a lovable child, but she is just so bitter uh, because her husband, as soon as they found out that Skipper wasn't right, her husband left him. So she never leaves her trail. She never leaves her screen door. She watches uh, Skipper th through there. But we know that, that she loves him. Uh, and Marlon, played by Larry, is during the, the picnic scene, is able to get Evelyn to agree to take Skipper to the picnic. And while she's waiting, she hears the phone ring. We go into her fantasy. And what it is, what it was, was the only, she could never understand why her husband Harley would leave her. And this was the most fanciful way that she could come up with it. So let's, let's watch first the way it is in the movie. Will you take me fishing now? No, but I'll take you for a hot dog. You bring him right back. Why don't you join us, Evelyn? We've got a special tonight. All you can eat, and a free wish. No, thanks. I already ate. Don't you let Clifford give him any beer. Hello? You got your call through, Sergeant. Evelyn, are you there? Harley? Is that you, Harley? We'll be coming home soon, sweetheart. It's almost over. Why did you leave? Well, there's a war on, have you forgotten? I had to leave. so proud of him. He's a real hero. Who? Your mom wants to speak to you, boy. We'll be home soon, Mom. We've got the hunt and the run. Can't hold out much longer. Skipper? Are you there? I love you, Skipper. I love you too, Mommy. 
Marlon got me a hot dog. So there you see uh, her fantasy explaining why her husband has left her. Um, and I decided to take the opportunity here to, uh, to add a comment that wasn't exactly in the movie, which let was, me, let, go ahead. Let me back up a little bit because that, this, this was a number I was definitely going to take out right. of the show because, you know, uh, Joe Marie Brooks is so fantastic in it, but I can never get the scene to look the way I wanted it to look and I couldn't see it do it on stage. And there was another conversation with Larry and I and Danielle, and both of them were saying, I don't know, patriotism in West Virginia is pretty strong. Uh, we should probably think about it uh, more. And so we did, we started kicking it around. And I don't remember which of us said this, but we were giving our thoughts back and forth. And one of us you know, said, well, which war are they talking about? And, and, and one of us said, there's always another war. So that's yeah. I think I think that line came to me, and I thought this, there's the song right there, um, and and also part of the fantasy is that Skipper is not autistic in her in her fantasy. Uh, so he's at war with his dad and with a lot of other people because, as Danny said, the trailer park is probably full of veterans and people who fought in various wars from World War II on. Mm -hmm. And this is a comment about uh, how people can make fun of. The, the country people and the Appalachians and the hillbillies until it's wartime. And all of a sudden then they want them, they want us basically to go to go to fight the war. So that's what this song is about. <laughs> Called when the going 
kids are on you. First to fall and the first forgotten. First to fall and the first forgotten. There's always another war, and I guess there is. That's Ethan Jones singing there, and uh, that's our little comment uh, within Paradise Park. So I, I'm no expert in doing musicals. Danny and I did this. We put it together. We tried to give you a little idea during this thing of how we did it. There's plenty of ways to write musicals, but most of them, uh, I, I don't know how they do it in these big musicals that come out of movies. We we did it by looking at the movie going through and then trying to replace lines of dialogue pages of the script with songs. And in so doing, we added some things that, that weren't in the movie, but basically we amplified what was in the movie and tried to uh, do replace the uh, fantasy scenes that really couldn't easily do on stage. So thanks to Danny, I got involved. And uh, thanks to Scott Hill, Theater West Virginia. Uh, thanks to also to Festival of Charleston for letting us do this now. And the Light Opera Guild, from hopefully we'll be seeing it in the next few months, uh, maybe next year at the Light Opera Guild, and also to uh, West Virginia State University for helping us out mm -hmm. and making all this possible. And uh, I'm Larry Gross, and what, do you have any sign off? I'm, I'm Danny message? Boyd, and thank you, West Virginia. <laughs> you know, it, it's just, we birthed all this out of there, and that's, that's uh, what a place to come from. Thank yeah. you all, thanks, thank you for having this festival.